did you hear that alert this meeting I did. recorded yeah I got it. No. all right so th we'll begin in three three two one hello everybody and welcome back to my channel my name is quentin stuckey otherwise known as stux and today i'm here with a very very special guest uh writer bill allen he is the author of a new book and it's the the title if you could remind me again it's uh, the confessions of a sensitive, sensitive man, man. Yeah, yes. that's right. So we're really excited to have him here today. As most of you know, I have made a bunch of videos talking about my experiences, not just as a highly sensitive person, but as a highly sensitive male. And I'm really, really excited and honored to have Bill Allen on my channel today. And his book has come out just a couple of weeks ago. I believe it was November 4th. It's available on Amazon and bookstores like Barnes and Noble and Indigo. It's available everywhere. So be sure to pick up your copy and I'll be sure to put a link to that in the description below. So without further ado, let's talk to Bill Allen. So first of all, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, doing really well. Awesome. Glad to be here and, and uh, it's good talking to you again. Yeah, great talking to you again. Bill and I had uh, our first meeting uh, last week and right away as typically happens when you meet another highly sensitive person, we took to each other like ducks to water. It was absolutely fantastic. So I'm really excited to have you back again and to have our conversation recorded because we had such a good talk last time. And now this time it will be, I think, an even better conversation and more people will be seeing it. So um, my first question to you is one that I'm sure is often asked of most people when they are talking about their high sensitivity. When did you first realize that you had this trait in you, even before you knew the term highly sensitive? When did that really enter your mind, if you can remember? Well, you know, interesting about it, uh, the book is part autobiographical. So I had to reach down and start pulling out memories of things that I knew that kind of indicated to me that uh, I was highly sensitive. And I can remember as a child being very sensitive to my environment, uh, especially uh, when I was young, we moved around a few different times, and which meant that I had to kind of start over with schools and churches and things like that, which was kind of traumatic to me. I was not used to a change of environment like that. And I have one incident where I remember very clearly when I was going to, uh, we changed churches. I must have been about four or five years old. And my parents had to leave me in a particular Sunday school class. And I can remember having all these feelings of abandonment, of you know, th this is the end of the world. And I, I was sensing and feeling all these really weird things that I wasn't used to. And as I look back on that, it was probably my first indication that I was different. I, my reaction to things was maybe a little bit uh, stronger, maybe a little over the top for most normal kids. And I thought there was something different about me. And, you know, as you go through life, you go through life experiencing it as you're growing up. I started to see those same things occurring over and over again. And I knew uh, we had a term in our family because there's a lot of uh, highly sensitive people in my family that it's kind of high strung or tightly wound. Or these are some of the terms they use mm -hmm. for people that were highly sensitive. They didn't always come across very positively, but that, I just figured that that was part of our family nature or whatever. And of course, didn't have a clue that there was, it was actually a personality characteristic. Um, but yeah, that's probably one of my first recollections of that. Awesome. What, uh, like you mentioned the experience that you had in church, what, because obviously it's a little bit, at least in our culture and Western culture, it's a little bit different being a highly sensitive male versus being a highly sensitive female. I think that there are emotional expectations that are both placed on men and on women. Women are, are encouraged to, or women are expected to be more sensitive on average than men, and men are discouraged away from it, not even being sensitive. That's not even necessarily the right way to put it, but from displaying any emotions other than anger or even, even joy is something that um, oftentimes I remember stories that my dad had told me about his dad, even being very happy about something or being very excited was seen as feminine, seen as too much. It was seen as too much of a spontaneous emotional expression. And so my follow-up question to you is, how did you feel as a, you know, as a, as a, as a male growing up and knowing that you had the sensitivity within you, but also 
kind of realizing that there were these kind of invisible rules, like invisible and vis visible rules, kind of um, guiding you along what was acceptable behavior and what wasn't acceptable behavior as a guy. Yeah, I, and that's, I call that in the book, the boy code and the man code. Uh, and I grew up in, in the, the South of, of the United States, Southeastern United States and South Carolina. And there was pushback almost immediately as I was growing up. I mean, I, any type of outburst of crying or emotions or not feeling right about something or, or whatever, I would get this feedback that you needed to be a little man, that you needed to, to, to not do these things. These were not acceptable behaviors. And unfortunately, that's true for a lot of uh, highly sensitive boys who were growing up, there, especially with fathers who are trying to meet this sort of cultural definition of what masculinity is. And you're right, it's, it's, there's always a pushback about emotion. Don't show emotion, that's not a masculine thing to do. Uh, and sh because showing emotion means that you're not logical, that you're not calm, that you're not in control. And of course, as we all know, emotion is a very innate human capacity. And it's very useful for us to have that to be able to express it. Uh, a lot of times, it's just a great way to vent and get things out of the inside so that we can move on with our lives. But men aren't allowed to do that very often. And we're, we have these sort of uh, uh, poster boys of, or poster men, if you will, of what men are supposed to be through movies, through sports, through, you know, uh, literature even, where we're supposed to be this, um, you know, unemotional, uh, almost uh, unfeeling person who's never vulnerable, never makes mistakes, and never asks for help. And that's really an unfortunate kind of, uh, uh, you know, kind of a stack up uh, personality that, that I don't think any man can really live up to, but it's mm -hmm. especially hard for HSPs because we are wired much differently than non HSPs. Extremely. We are more emotional. We do show things uh, more, uh, more easily and we process things more deeply. So these things tend to stick with us longer um, so as I was growing up, I started to see that right away. I wasn't meeting up to the, the man code, the boy code. And it really did start as an HSP would do. I started to think about it. Why did I not meet up with this expectation and started questioning my masculinity as a result of it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very unfortunate state of circumstances, but you know, that does persist even now. Yeah, absolutely. You actually, you touched on something that I had just thought of there about the relationship between logic and emotions. And I once read recently, and I can't remember, <clears throat> excuse me, the exact details of this one, this, this case with this man, but he had been in some sort of horrible accident. He had received some kind of brain injury mm -hmm. and they checked out, they did a bunch of MRIs on him and they found that his brain seemed to be working normally. All the parts seemed to match up. There wasn't anything really abnormal, but he started making these peculiar decisions. He started doing things that were against his own best interests. And so he started gambling more. He started ignoring his wife and his kids. He was out late at night and he was just making all of these decisions that didn't quite jive with the person that he was before, because beforehand I, he was a pretty successful uh, businessman and he uh was able to provide for his wife and kids and and you know on all accounts he was extremely conscientious extremely successful extremely happy he had a good life he didn't have any underlying health issues physical or mental and then he gets this he gets into this accident and i believe it was a car accident and all of a sudden he just starts making all of these um illogical decisions he starts doing things that are completely against his own interest mm -hmm. And no one could figure out what was wrong with him um, until he went to a psychotherapist and he started talking about how he understood that the things that he was, that he was doing were against his interest, but he couldn't stop himself from doing them. He was able to actually rationalize all these decisions that he made using his own sense of logic. And eventually what the psychotherapist discovered was that the emotional centers of his brain 
like his parts of his limbic system, which, you know, is known as the emotional part of the brain, the emotional brain, those parts were not working as well. They were not connecting as well. And so he didn't lose his sense of logic, but he lost his sense of emotion. He completely went down in his emotional intelligence. And so it's kind of a fallacy that people make about th that there's this dichotomy between emotions and logic because they both completely inform each other because you could say, well, he, you know, you could get very nihilistic and say, well, he can do whatever he wants. He has free will and life doesn't really matter. He's going, going to be dead soon. So what difference does it make if he doesn't support his family? And he was able to, again, he was able to rationalize his, his treatment of that, but without his emotions, without his emotional intelligence, he was completely doing things that were not within his own interest and his life completely deteriorated because he lost that capacity within himself to have emotions, to have feelings, to have a sense of right and wrong, to have a basically a sense of morality. And so that's a big fallacy that people make that, that emotions and logic are separate. They completely inform each other. You can't really have one without the other and have a meaningful life. You know, everyone obviously needs to have a meaningful life. So yeah, I think that that's something that's extremely pervasive, especially in Western culture and especially for men. Yeah, and think about this too that boys start getting this message very early on. You know, usually when they're two, three years old, they start picking up the message that you need to be more a man-like. Um, in fact, I think from my memory of uh, my days at, at, uh, co in college and majoring in psychology, there were studies that were done that showed little boys cried more than little girls. They got frustrated more easily. Mm -hmm. and, and as you know, as boys, grow older, two, three, four years old, they start getting this message that that's not acceptable anymore. You can't cry. Now, the message gets embedded in their subconscious because at that point in, in life, children are like sponges. They, most of the time, their brain is an alpha and theta brainwave state. And so they're absorbed, it's the same state that you have during hypnosis and high suggestible states. Mm -hmm. And so they're learning everything. They, and there's no critical thinking capacity at that age. So nothing gets criticized. There's no, well, maybe I shouldn't do that because I don't feel like being a man. I want to be something else. Everything is brought in and accepted as is. So that becomes a part of who they are, their personality. And think about that as we get older and we grow up. Those programs, if you will, those early learnings that we accepted at face value as a child, dictate portions of our life, even HSP men. I know for myself, I oftentimes would try to stifle some emotion if I felt that it was unmasculine for me to do that. And so you, it, very good point that you brought up. These things are absolutely connected together. I think being, um, um, having emotion, expressing emotion, using emotion is a natural human characteristic. And the part about fitting in with logic is exactly exactly that. Sometimes the emotion motivates the logic to become, you know, uh, acting out as a behavior that we need to do for survival reasons. So, yeah, I agree. But, you know, the perception is that's the thing that really is mm -hmm. the problem here is the perception is that men need to be little logical uh, automatons and not be human, not be emotional, whereas women are given sort of a free license to be as emotional as they like to be, because we see that as a feminine characteristic. And it's very unfortunate, because truly, emotional reactions to things are a human characteristic, and we should be you know, encouraging that in men. And it's it's a frustrating point for a lot of men, especially older men who may have issues, problems with their, their life, with what's going on, things they feel like they can't control, but they're not allowed to express that. And that's become a real problem for a lot of men, especially men over the age of 50, where, who have been really conditioned their whole life not to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And one of the things that you and I had talked about the, our first conversation was you know explaining the the high suicide rate amongst men it's extremely yeah. high higher than women and i always believed and i you know across the years and i don't know for certain if there's any actual evidence that 
that this is why, I mean, certainly I'm, there's probably a number of reasons why the suicide rate amongst men is higher. But I think one of the main reasons is that men um, are, again, conditioned to not express vulnerability and to also be less likely to seek out help. It, it takes a lot for for men to reach out and admit that they are hurting, whether physically or emotionally. I think that physically it's probably easier for men to admit that they're hurting if, you know, if they have a bad shoulder or something like that. I have a lot of friends that are not HSPs and they're, and they're guys and they are in therapy and they don't want anyone to know about it. They, there's like this kind of sense of shame. And I, and I pointed that out to them several times. I, I say to them, there's absolutely no shame whatsoever with talking to a therapist. Like, it doesn't matter what your gender identity is. There's like, you're, if you're having problems and you want to get professional help, then you do that. You get professional help. And so I think that it's, it's a shame that that is, again, that that's still a narrative. And, even, and, and those are friends that are my age. It's not even like they're older friends. Those are friends from my generation. And my generation, Generation Z, is supposed to be um, extremely uh, tolerant and, and open. But those uh, narratives are still being played out. And the guys that I know that are, that are in therapy, I wouldn't necessarily call them... Um, particularly, again, sensitive or emotional people. I wouldn't necessarily characterize them that way. And so it's interesting when I often wonder, like how, when I meet, especially when I meet a lot of men in my life and I can always tell, and I'm sure maybe you can relate to this too as an HSP, I can always tell if they're putting on the performance of masculinity or if I'm actually getting the real person, the person behind that kind of veil. I always wonder that all the time. And, and I'm more fascinated by by men that talk openly about their thoughts and feelings than men that don't talk openly about their thoughts and feelings. So that's, that's something that, again, that's another example of how just pervasive these kind of toxic ideals of masculinity are. And certainly the definition of masculinity needs to be uh, redefined. And one, th one other thing that you said that I also wanted to talk about was um, you were, you have stated, and I believe you state in the book that a lot of our societal problems can be, trace back to these toxic forms of masculinity. And if you could talk more about that, I'd love to hear it. Yeah. I, it, what, one of the things that sort of came out of, of doing this book was this, and we've talked, you know, uh, uh, before about toxic masculinity. There is a, actually a term for that. It's hegemonic masculinity. And it, it really focuses on kind of the dominant white male um, figure uh, that is uh, suppressing others that are not white male uh, elite kind of people. Um, but part of the whole problem with our culture is this definition of what men are supposed to be. And um, the idea that men are these, these invulnerable superheroes uh, that uh, don't have uh, any kind of vulnerability, don't want to expose that, don't want to show that, is, a, is actually quite toxic for men. Uh, it's toxic in many ways for women who have to live with that or for children who have to live with that or people who don't fit that so-called norm, that ideal. But it's really toxic for all men trying to live up to that expectation. And going back to the societal things, if you think about some of the main problems we have today, things like climate change, which is this idea that we have some sort of domain over the, the earth and that we can do what we want to and there's no consequences for doing things. Mm -hmm. uh, that's all about uh, sort of this selfish desire to rape and pillage the earth. That's a problem. The relationships you see with uh, racial situations where people of color are not recognized is traced back, in my opinion, to this hegemonic masculinity. Um, ideas about how women are treated, mm -hmm. about how LGBTQ people are treated, um, is being sort of outside of that, that, that sphere of leaders, or, or what we'd call people who kind of run the show, is that toxic masculinity. It spins around and it's what dominates us. Now, where it's come from, whether it, it can be traced back to, uh, religious roots or whether it can be traced back culturally for thousands of years. And we know there's cultures that had, have had women in leadership roles that have been very mm -hmm. successful. And if you look at it today, some of the, speaking of COVID, uh, some of the most successful 
uh, countries in dealing with COVID are led by women who get what you know, needs to be done and what has to happen. Our so chief medical idea, officer is a woman here yeah, in Canada. Yeah, exactly. So the idea that men are the only competent ones that can run things and do things is just a complete uh, misrepresentation, misrepresentation of what the human population as a whole can do to, to solve these things. And I think even now, when you look at what's happening in the United States, the, the president that we've elected, it is probably the poster child for toxic masculinity. If, uh, and I think everybody in the world sees that. And even, I would say, at least half the people in the U.S. see it. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a, there is still this kind of uh, holding on to this traditional viewpoint. But I, I do not think that we can evolve as a species until we start allowing, one, other groups of people to participate fully in society and also allowing men to back off some of this a little bit so that we, they can be assisting, helping in, in positions where they're uh, not having to be leaders, where they can actually be uh, contributing in some other capacity, you know, in some other way. Um, and I really do think so many of our societal problems trace back just to that sort of mentality we have about men and masculinity. And one of the things that I was writing the book is I kept thinking, now this is something that Dr. Aaron, Elaine Aaron, has uh, kind of championed in her newsletters and in some of her books, is this idea that highly sensitive people have a, an evolutionary reason for being in existence. It's the, we're the canary in the coal mine. We're the ones who can alert to things that we sense in the environment. We know where things are wrong. And I really believe now, um, and one of the things that I call out in the book is that for highly sensitive men to start sort of stepping up and modeling this new role model uh, for what men could be. Now, not all men are going to be highly sensitive, but what it can show other men is that it's okay to be emotional. You can still be competent. You can still be strong and be emotional at the same time. It's a, you know, the idea of sensitivity. I mean, we hear that term, uh, knowing, uh, growing up and hearing that term over the years, it was always sort of considered to be a weakness. You know, you're, you're sensitive and so you're weak. You're too mm -hmm. sensitive, right? But sensitivity is much more than that. And this is where we as HSPs need to get out and educate the population about sensitivity is a lot more than the emotional components. It's about knowing what's going on in the environment. It's about our intuition, our great empathy that we have and, and wanting to nurture and help other people. It, it's just an ex excessively positive trait when you look at all the good things that could come from it. And so part of this is getting men on board with this idea that being highly sensitive is, does not make you any less of a man. Mm -hmm. In fact, it, it, I kind of think it's our superpower. Um, yeah. And I think it makes us um, a lot more aware of things and uh, puts us in a unique position where we can be counselors, advisors, and yes, even leaders, thought leaders, mm -hmm. um, people that can model this characteristic so other men can see this and say, you know, that's not so bad. Maybe I should try to be a little more vulnerable now and then mm -hmm. or a little bit more open with my emotions. You know, as you were talking about your friends who are afraid to admit that they were going to uh, to see a therapist, the idea there is, I think, the, the gist of that idea is that going to a therapist is a kind of an emotional thing. And mm -hmm. if you have to have repairs made to you uh, on an emotional level, then that shows that you're weak. Now, if they had to go get a, a broken arm set, that wouldn't be nearly as... Uh, something that they wouldn't share with friends very easily. But to say, I've got to go to a therapist because I've got some problems and issues I need to work through. That's a whole different other thing, right? And that goes to yeah. that emotional weakness. It's not even, a, and another reason, um, I think that even, I think that there, even there's still a stigma amongst sort of, or at least not, not just a stigma, but I think also a confusion about mental health care because you know, if you break if you break something or if you have something physically wrong with you, 
for the most part, depending upon what it is, it's, it's obvious what needs to be done. You take, you take the medicine, you have the surgery, you change your diet. You know, there, there, are, there are things that you can do on a biological level, but in terms of a psychological level, if you're suffering from chronic depression or chronic anxiety, or you have an eating disorder, whatever it might be, it's not always so obvious what it is you have to do because issues like that are incredibly, incredibly complex. And there's almost an infinite amount of things that are influencing someone's poor mental health. Obviously, mm -hmm. some of it is to do with environment. Some of it is to do with maybe inbuilt personality traits. And some of it's even to do with, uh, with unresolved uh, childhood trauma. In mm -hmm. fact, there was a book I read. It was called The, the Body Keeps the Score. And it was all about, uh, I think the subtitle of the book was The Mind and Body and the Healing of Trauma. And one of the things, I t one of the things that the writers talked about was how uh, complex PTSD, CPTSD, is extremely an extremely pervasive health issue. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the research they'd done had shown that it was behind a lot of the rising rates of alcoholism, of mm -hmm. spousal abuse, of child abuse. And that trauma, if it, of course, if it's unresolved, it gets passed on to future generations and the cycle just keeps perpetuating. And so I think that as a culture as well, that, that as much as we have, you know, nowadays we have the Bell Let's Talk Day in every January. And on one, on one hand, that is helpful. But then on another hand, I don't really think that that's enough because, I mean, now you can see more businesses and workplaces, especially nowadays with the COVID-19 pandemic, accepting that their employees might take a mental health day every now and then and giving that more legitimacy than they would have in years previous because I remember even when I when I first started working when I was 15 and I hated working I didn't have any concept of like no this is really good for me this is how I'm going to earn money like even outside of getting paid um, I hated it I hated my job I, I think and I think that some of that had to do with being a highly sensitive person and working in a grocery store and I was surrounded by just a locker room of like the most toxically masculine things that you could possibly think of and, you know, and I could tell that there were some men in that working environment that didn't believe everything that they jo joked about or everything that they said, they were just keeping up with that performance of masculinity because men will police each other. And if there's one sign that you are deviating from the norm, you, you are shunned. And so I remember really disliking my job and really often wanting to take mental health days and just wanting to have a day off. And I remember, uh, you know, my family saying to me, well, you're not sick. Why would you take a day off? What do you mean you don't feel like going? And so I think that that's, that's also another issue that I think is affecting not just highly sensitive men, but highly sensitive people in that our culture is still trying to figure out the best way to make sure that people receive adequate mental health care treatment. I think right. that we are getting better at that. I don't think that we're perfect at that. But then again, we're not necessarily perfect at physical health treatment as well. And it's certainly, certainly healthcare is not accessible to every single person. There's all kinds of societal inequalities and disparities that contribute to someone's inability to receive that adequate treatment and care. And that's a whole other problem. But I think that there is still kind of a stigma around receiving counseling because again, it's, it is seen. And I think even for women too, I think it's this, I think it's similar. It's kind of the same for women, but maybe to a, to a different degree where it's like, what's wrong with you? Why can't you, why, what do you mean you're depressed? Like, what do you mean you can't figure it out? It's almost seen as a bit of a weakness of character. Like I have, I have friends who have relatives that, that um, again, they also see it as a weakness of character and don't believe that anxiety and depression are a thing that this generation is just more open about their mental health. But that, of course, that's not the case. I mean, anxiety and depression rates have skyrocketed over the last 10 years. And a lot of that is something that we also talked about in our last conversation. Uh, a lot of that has to do with the advent or the, the presence of social media and people my age and younger nowadays spending more and more time online. And that's only been exacerbated by the pandemic. It's just gotten worse because now we're really online constantly. And we're not really taught that kind of social media hygiene or that internet hygiene of like monitoring how much you're using. So yeah, I think that, I think highly sensitive people and highly sensitive men have a big role to play and they I believe that, that we can really heal the world. We're able to see problems in completely different lights and we're, we're also able to anticipate problems. And so if men and men, if they identify with this, high, this trait of high sensitivity and they read Dr. Lane Aaron's book or they read your book and it really resonates with them, 
to just to be open about it as much as they can and to be themselves and to not be afraid to be themselves. I think that that's, I think that that's probably the great, at least from my experiences, that's probably the greatest thing that or the worst part of hiding that part of myself that I always knew was there because it's such a, it's not the entire component of my identity, but it's certainly a fundamental component of who I am. And to deny that just doesn't make sense. Why would you deny who you are? Everyone deserves to be who they are, regardless of what culture tells you that you have to be. But it's an ongoing battle between what, what I, who I am and then what, it, what my culture expects of me. It's an ongoing battle for everyone, regardless of high sensitivity. So, yeah. Yeah, you know, and uh, I think the very first thing that, that most uh, sort of steps that high sensitive men go through is this, at some point they hopefully come to a recognition that, that this is a personality characteristic. Today, there's a lot more avenues for spreading the word about it. Uh, social media has been pretty good. There's Facebook groups and a lot of online websites and books and things that you can pick up now that you didn't have when I was growing up. Uh, so, first of all, getting sort of uh, a grip about what the characteristics are. And then I think a very big important part of the, the next step is accepting it and embracing it, that it's not a bad thing, that it's, that you may be different, you know, that, that may be a characteristic because truly 20% of the population versus 80%, you are going to be uh, different than, than, say, the average person you run to run into in the street but the idea is to embrace that difference and realize that it's a gift and I think that's one of the things that we need to get out to highly sensitive men and in particular highly sensitive boys um, is this idea that you have something you have a gift it's not a burden I mean at times it may feel that way but it, the reality is that it's if you frame it in kind of that evolutionary wrapper that I was talking about with Dr. Aaron, you realize you have a purpose, even if you have another purpose in life, which may be to be a writer, it may be to do something else, maybe a, a lawyer, doctor, whatever. But the point is that you do have another underlying purpose. Uh, that's to be a beacon for the, the people around you. You don't have to be one that writes a book that becomes gives you national exposure or anything like that. It could be local. It could be your family. It could be your school, your church, your job, wherever. Educate people about the trait. I, I think part of the thing is, like you were talking about, and I've been in those situations too, where you're in a group of people at work and they're all males and they're all doing the posturing of masculinity and stuff. Part of that is, you know, and we do tend to work better one on one than we do in groups of large groups of people. So maybe you get somebody off to the side and, and you start showing your empathetic side to them. In other words, that is, you kind of listen to what their issues are. And, and you, if you listen keenly enough, you'll be able to pull something out that you can kind of grab hold of with that person and start sharing that empathy will start breaking down those masculine barriers that they're putting up, which is basically in many ways is a defense to, to, to protect their inner ego, their core. Mm -hmm. um, and then you start making inroads one-on-one -on -one with that person. That's how we start educating people. It's almost like one person at a time sometimes, or even a small group at a time is educating people about the trait. Once we start doing that in enough numbers, I think, people will start to understand that being sensitive is really a very novel thing, but it's also a very good thing. And it's good for the culture and it's good for uh, the individual and those that are around those individuals. Um, and so I, it's kind of a, a ripple in a pond kind of thing. You drop in a single uh, rock or something and it, the, the waves go outward and outward and outward. And I think that's what we need to do. And I, kind of one of the reasons why I wrote the book was to relay my personal experience and how I felt about going through these things. This is not a psychology book. This is not something that, uh, say, a Dr. Aaron's or Dr. Tracy Cooper or uh, Tom Falkenstein or any of those people who are more in the understanding at the psychology level. This is about kind of a boots on the ground. This is how my experience was. This is a slice of one man who grew up sensitive, uh, it, it, you know, in a world that was kind of hostile to sensitivity in men. And my impressions and the things that I learned 
And I do believe, Quentin, there's very important things that we can learn from the tribe. We're all part of a tribe, an HSB tribe. Mm -hmm. We can all share with each other. We can all relate experiences. It doesn't matter how old you are, how experienced you are. We all have experiences to share. And I think we should do that. And I think that helps build us up um, in our own minds and I, hopefully in the, in the minds of the culture that we live in. Yeah, absolutely. And you actually led into my, my next formal question for you, which was to tell us more about your book. Do you have a favorite, do you have a favorite chapter in the book or one that you think um, was particularly maybe rewarding or cathartic for you to write as a highly sensitive person? You know, it's funny that you mentioned, I mean, I, I wrote a blog for four years and out of the blog came this book. I mean, basically the, the book, I had to organize it and put it together. I had to write additional material. Some of it is just sort of tramping through the data that I picked up and learned over the years. Some of it was writing personal experiences, but oddly enough, it was the last chapter of the book that when I finish reading a chapter, I literally tear up and cry. Mm. It's, it's in the chat. The title is called can't find my way home. It's really not about finding a home. It's, a, it's about a journey that I've been on my whole life. And part of that self-discovery was finding about myself, finding out who I was. What was my purpose? I mean, I did things for a living that, quite honestly, did not fit my personality. They met financial goals, but they didn't meet the core goals of my soul, right? And so as I kind of went through chronicling the, the episodes of my life, different areas and aspects. It was that last chapter, and it's a very short chapter, but it's a very personal chapter in which I basically, I hope, reaches to the core of any sensitive man or any person that reads it, that there's hope. You know, don't, don't think because you're different, don't think because you're sensitive and everybody else around you is not, that there aren't people out there who understand. There aren't people like you. And see, growing up, I never knew that until later in life when Dr. Ahrens wrote her book. And I started to realize, you know what? There are people like me. It is a characteristic. And it's not, you know, honestly, we're not like a little small group. I mean, mm -hmm. I think they estimated that there's like a billion people in the world who are HSPs. That's not a small group of people, you know? It's very significant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But in relationship to the larger group, it's, we're, you know, it's eight to two. So in the minority, um, yeah. But sometimes it's those minorities are the ones that are contribute the most. And, and I think about people, as you were saying, you know, you can sort of peg an HSP person pretty easily if you've been doing this, if you've been paying attention uh, to people that you talk to and so forth. And I started, was writing the book, I started trying to think who, who do I know of people that I thought were extremely highly sensitive people that did were celebrities or people that were in the limelight. And the person that stuck out to me the most was Robin Williams, the comedian. Mm -hmm. um, I kept thinking, here's a man who has um, a facade that he puts up, which is this crazy madcap, quick thinking, very quick witted man. And then you compare that with, the types of roles he played in his dramatic roles, where he's a very sensitive, very caring, very deep individual. And I think he was so good in those roles because that was his natural state. It was that. Uh, it was a wonderfully funny man, but I, I was certainly drawn to his, his very sensitive roles and some of the dramatic pieces that he did. Mm -hmm. He would have been, it was very sad about his life and how it ended. Um, and um, I wrote a little bit about that in the book, but, but the idea was that he, as complex as he was, I think at his core, and I have no way of knowing this for sure, but I think at his core, he was a highly sensitive man. He saw things, he perceived things, he nuanced things out of the environment, and he twisted them around in his mind, and, and they came out as funny anecdotes or funny lines for a, a comedy routine. He was very spontaneous. He had a very quick and agile mind. And that's what sensitive people do. Mm -hmm. They pick up things in the world that nobody else sees. That's why so many artists and so many authors and so many people who are in positions of 
of philosophers, whatever, or sensitive people, because that's the gift that we have, is that ability to see things that, and we talked about this last time, you know, walk into a, a room, a party, and you, you're the one who smells the lady with the perfume across the room. You, the music may be a little too loud. The bass line may be too much. The hors d'oeuvres may be a little too salty. Those are the things that we put together. Taken collectively, I think that's what makes us the kind of the perceivers, the observers of life. That, to me, is what makes us valuable. I completely 100% agree with you. I even have experiences where if I'm, uh, because I'm a big morning person and a big day person and my roommate is uh, a night person and I'm always, I'm always aware of, I, you know, even if he doesn't complain, I think to myself, okay, this volume is a little too loud. This volume could be a little lower. I can kind of sense and you can, it's, it's, it's interesting because it's almost the, the, the feelings of intuition that I get are almost beyond language. They completely transcend language. Like I've had people ask me, you know, how would you define intuition and how would you describe your intuition? And it honestly is like, it's just, it's, it's a, it's a, the best way to put it is that it's a feeling. It's a feeling that something is going on. And even if I can't see it or hear it, and I have no other tangible evidence that it's going on. I, I know that it's, that it's going on or it has the potential to go on. And so if I'm alone here and I'm out in my living room and I'm playing something out loud or I'm moving all around a lot, I can almost feel that I'm, I am disturbing him. Even if he doesn't come out and say, hey, you're really disturbing me. Or even if I don't hear his feet shuffle, I can know, I'm always um, cognizant of how loud I'm being. And then that is something that is, I think, uniquely um, – a highly sensitive person um, uh, trait to have and practice to have because I meet other people that um, don't realize just how, um, how loud they're being. I had the experience actually with uh, uh, my girlfriend a couple of weeks ago, we were walking in a, a Toronto park and we were about to go through this tunnel. It was a shortcut to get back to my apartment from the park that we were at. And these people were filming something. And, you know, whenever you film something in public, you have people just walking by in the shot, not really caring, you know, not giving a fuck. And, and mm-hmm. I noticed right away that they're filming something. We need to go the other way. And my girlfriend went, why are we going this way? What's happening? And I said, well, they're filming something. And she said, no, they're not. And I said, no, 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 they are. And they're getting very frustrated that people are walking in front of their shot. So let's go the other way. Let's not. And, and my my rationalization, I was like, if I were doing that, if I were filming something in public, if I was trying to do something creative in public, especially in a busy, busy, uh, busy city like Toronto, I would not, I would be very annoyed. Well, I would be very annoyed and very upset that people were not respecting the fact that I was trying to do something creative. And, you know, and that was something that was, that was a moment I had where I don't get those all the time with all the time with friends, but I get them sometimes where I'm like, I, I am that canary in the coal mine. I, I see, I, I experience things a little bit differently. I always say to people that, you know, the volume for you might be here, but for me, it's maybe about there. And it's just, a, it's, it's a different, it's a completely different experience and one that I think needs to be shared more. And, you know, it's interesting when you even consider that, I mean, I was, so I was born in 1997 and I believe it was either 1997 or 1996 when Elaine Aaron released her book. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's in a, that's in a recent amount of time that this trait was even discovered. The trait, a lot of people forget that the trait is not just seen in human beings. It's also seen in animals. And cool. so there's cross species, you know, continuity from an evolutionary perspective. Like, so people, and people forget that too. And oftentimes when I tell people that, because I've, I've had conversations with people and they say, that doesn't sound like it's a real thing. It sounds like it's a, it's an excuse for, for uh, your personality or it's an excuse to not do things. It's an excuse to be lazy. And that's the example I always give to people that it, no, it actually, it, it, it is seen in animals as well. There's even fruit flies can be highly sensitive. And, you know, there are people there and there are still people that I encounter who um, don't, they misunderstand the trait. And I think that one of the reasons they misunderstand it is because it's not completely seeped into the culture at this point in time. I think it's really getting there. I think that there is a bigger, bigger community of HSPs, especially again with the advent of technology and having things like Reddit, having Facebook groups, having meetup groups. I was a member of a, a Toronto HSP meetup group for a little while. And 
you know, I met a lot. I met both women and men there. It was actually split pretty equally, 50-50. Mm-hmm. And that was really heartwarming to see, especially to see the men come out there. And there was no, it was like, it was some of the best experiences I had with, with, uh, with male friends because I could see that there was no, there was no hegemonic masculine policing. And that was really refreshing. And, um, but I think again, back to sort of back to your point, I think in general that sensitivity is just a trait that we need to encourage in men in general and not just in highly sensitive men who sensitivity is already, you know, certainly one of their uh, predominant languages that they use to communicate with the world. We really need to encourage more men to, and even I think another way of putting it is to just be honest, be honest about what's on your mind and what you're feeling and to not put such a filter or such a mental block in front of expressing vulnerability. I think that that's a really important part too. Yes. And yeah, so I think that, yeah, I think that people f- like fundamentally either they misunderstand the trade or they're just not aware of it. I think that it's not as seeped in the public consciousness as much as it could be, but I think it's really getting there. And I think that the publication of your book is a part of that movement. Your book is actually the first book I've ever come across where it is specifically told from a highly sensitive male's perspective. It's not just in a general sense about HSPs. It's really about HSMs. And that is extremely refreshing, especially, again, especially today, especially nowadays. Yeah. Um, Well, I can tell you this. I think there is some momentum building for this. There's a a psychology therapist uh, from Germany. His name is Tom Falkenstein, who's written a book called The Highly Sensitive Man. That's out there. Tracy Cooper, Dr. Tracy Cooper has written some books. He's also an HSP um, and written some books. A lot of, I, I haven't read Tom's book yet, but I have read Tracy's books and, and, and they're really, uh, he, he's a wonderful researcher. He's got some great insights. He's got some interesting things that he's come up with. High sensation seeking HSP males and, and females. Mm-hmm. That's, that's another great book. In, that's an interesting slice that you know, mm-hmm. I, I found out that I had a piece of that as well. Me too. Um, I fall I fall into that category as well. Yeah. So yeah, yeah but reviews. you're right. I mean, and we lost Dr. Ted Zeff this past year, who was mm-hmm. also somebody who was a real champion for HSP males. Um, but yes, I I really think there is a tremendous need now for more and more uh, HSP uh, males uh, to get out there and start uh, writing books or doing blogs or as you're doing podcasts um, to get the word out about this. Um, And I think there are probably more HSP men who don't know about the trait than maybe HSP women Mm -hmm. um, because they're not looking for it or perhaps they just already resigned themselves to that. Well, I'm a quirky kind of guy. You know, I'll never figure this out. Yeah, uh, and if they're the, they follow that typical prototypical male thing, they're not going to be looking for this kind of thing. Uh, but once they find it, I, I I've had so many men tell me, "Gosh, this is great to know. I never knew this, and it really has opened my eyes about stuff." Just like it did for me, mm-hmm. you know, when I read uh, Dr. Aaron's book. So, yeah, it's it's something that we all need to be mindful of and to promote. Um, and I'm you know felt very fortunate that I was able to put this book together. Um, and I've got another book that will be coming out maybe next year, which is a little bit more, some things that I've done, sort of practical things. I wouldn't call it a workbook, but it's kind of a follow on to this book. Uh, hopefully be able to get that done uh, sometime next year or so. Um, yeah, it's, it's just, it's like I said, it's been a great pleasure meeting people and talking to them about this. And I'm learning all the time as well. So, um, yeah, we need to keep the foot to the pedal on this to make sure. Yeah, absolutely. My other question for you, um, this is my second last one, is uh, what has your experience been self-publishing the book? How has that experience been for you? It's been a learning experience the entire way. Um, I, you know, a long time ago, I wrote a screenplay. Uh, I lived in uh, Los Angeles and I wrote a screenplay and I got a, an agent assigned an agent and everything. And I was really excited. I thought, okay, I'm, I'm on my way. Mm-hmm. And what I had written was a screenplay that was really a little bit ahead of its time in terms of difficulty in producing. It, it would have involved a lot of CGI stuff that wasn't there yet to make it work. But the experience taught me that if I, if I, systematically got things together, I could actually make something happen, like get it at least in somebody's hands. 
the self-publishing thing is the same way. I uh, grabbed everything I could. I took some classes online about doing self-publishing. Uh, I found a company that does this kind of soup to nuts for you if you've got the manuscript. Um, I found a great editor out in Bend, Oregon, which is where I was, was from. Didn't know she was there uh, before I left. And um, it's just been one thing after another. It's almost, and I hate to say this, but it's almost kind of like it was meant to be. Things just kind of mm -hmm. fell into place. Once I got the idea that I was going to put this book together and I got started writing it, it just fell in place. And then the publishing part did the same thing. When I needed something, something happened. So I kind of feel a little bit faded about this. That's F-A-T-E-D, not F-A-D-E-D. Mm -hmm. um, about having this book done. Maybe it's, it's not so about much about me, it's about the subject and it's the time for the book to come. And I had told many people that I knew that I needed to do this this year because this year for some reason was, it was something that had to be done this year. And I'm so glad that I pushed myself to do it. But it's, like I said, it was a, it's an experience learning, growing, uh, mm -hmm. how to make things happen. We, COVID has made a, a different world for us to live in. So, you know, you Absolutely. gotta adapt. Um, yeah, absolutely. My final question for you is, um, this is a really, uh, at least I think it's a unique question. It was actually a question that was, uh, I first seen it in an interview with um, singer songwriter, Amy Winehouse, who I also suspect was a highly sensitive person. When you look at, I don't think that she was, she was the sort of the, the artist type of a highly sensitive person in that her songs were so completely raw and completely honest. And the way that she was completely vilified in the media there's a weed walker outside my door hopefully that's not being picked up on camera i can't even hear it <laughs> that's great um the way that she the way that she first of all the way that she obviously her her struggles with addiction and her honesty and rawness as an artist as a musical artist about her thoughts and feelings about her relationships i think that she also could have been a highly sensitive person. I certainly suspect that. And she was asked a question once of, uh, describe how you feel right now using four different adjectives. And that's the question I'm going to ask of you. Describe how you feel right now in general, not necessarily in this moment, but just right now in general in your life using four different adjectives. Uh, well, I mean, I may be stretching this a little bit. Uh, I, I honestly feel very hopeful about things that I think things are really going to start turning around. I don't have any, again, this is probably just intuition and in, in my, my own uh, uh, sense that things are going to get, things are going to get better. So I'm happy about that. Um, I would say that for me, there's a sense of fulfillment here as well that I've done something that I wanted to do. I've always wanted to be a writer. I always wanted to put this together, but life and family and career and everything else got in the way. So that was another thing. I'd be very feeling very fulfilled. Um, I like to think that I feel a lot more useful now that there's purpose now and I have something that I can, I can do um, that I hopefully can help other people. Um, and I, you know, I, it, it's almost the last one would be almost an indescribable word. It's, it's a combination of all three of those. Um, it's just a sense of, um, that I'm going to be part of a movement. I know that's not really so much of an adjective, but just being part of something bigger than me. Um, and that all those things tied together, I, I hope, are projecting some uh, positivity because I think right now this is what this world needs is that kind of thing, is, is positive, positive things going forward. Um, so that's kind of, you know, that's kind of my mood right now. That's kind of what I, I think that I feel like my life is going in that direction. Hopeful and, and positive um, are two things that are really kind of ringing true to me right now. That's fantastic. Well, William Allen, Bill Allen, it's been a pleasure to have you featured on my channel. And for those of you that are that have watched this, please go out and get his book, read it. I really think that it will resonate with you. My girlfriend's actually picking me up a copy for um, Christmas. She implied that I was telling you that last time. Um, I'm very anxious to read it. There are little snippets of it online. 
please go and check out uh, Bill's uh, blog as well. I'll link that in the description box and feel free to comment about your experiences as a highly sensitive person. And I think never be afraid to share your gift with the world with your innate uniqueness and all of us have a purpose. And I think that everyone, all the HSPs right now need to come together. And it's like you said, that in, in this global movement to make this trait more, I think not even acceptable, but I think that this trait more celebrated and this trait simply just more valued. And I think that we're really on the way. And I think that, that it's been years and years, centuries in the making really. And it all started with, for many people, that, that book by Dr. Elaine Aaron. And I think for a, lo a whole generation of people, it's going to start with your book. I think that your book is doing that too. Thanks so much for, for being on the channel today, Bill. Really appreciate it. And thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Fantastic.